So in the first chapter of this course, uh, chapter 14, we took a look at how expectations have an effect on the financial market. Mm -hmm. So this week, we are going to take a look at how expectations have an effect on consumption and investment. Once we've done that, next week, we can go to chapter 16, where we will sort of modify the ICLM model that we have already learned in ECO 207. Uh, but first, okay, so consumption and investment. So this chapter can be broken down into three parts. Uh, so part one is consumption. So I think in the book that's section 15.1. Uh, and then second, we have investment which is 15.2 in the book. And then of course, there is a combination when we put these two together. So that is 15.3. And we are going to be covering these three things uh, and finishing this chapter this week. Okay, so let's start off with consumption. And let's revise what we have already learned in 207 is that we know that consumption can be written like this. C is equal to C0 plus C1 YD. And if we were to define each of these terms, C0 is the autonomous consumption. Effectively, this is the consumption that takes place irrespective of whether we have any income or not. C1, which is a value between 0 and 1, is the marginal propensity to consume effectively tells us what percentage of our income we are consuming and the rest of course will be saved and this is also sometimes known as npc in short and yd is basically our income minus the tax we pay and this is known as disposable income and this is all we had talked about in equal to a seven about consumption. We have not gone into any details. Uh, in this course, we are going to be talking a bit more about uh, the values of each of this. Uh, more specifically, we don't need to talk about C0, autonomous consumption, uh, consumption that takes place irrespective of income. So this, as you can imagine, is the subsistence level of consumption. Let me write this down subsistence level consumption. So the absolute bare minimum that you need to consume to stay alive. But let's also make it clear that when I'm talking about consumption, I'm not literally talking about consumption, like the food that you eat. I'm talking about everything. You need a house to live in, you need clothes to wear. And, you know, so basically this is the autonomous spending, let's say. We don't need to talk a whole lot about this as well, because taxation that's set by the government, the individuals have no control over this. And we will talk about income in a lot of details in other places as well. So what we are going to focus on is C1, okay, which is the MPC. And basically the question that we want to ask and answer is, what determines the value of C1. So for example, I might have a C1 of 0 0.75, which means I'm consuming 75%, I'm spending 75% of my income and saving the other 25%. Someone else might have an MPC of 0 0.90, someone might have 0 0.30. I mean, why? Why does this vary? What is it that leads to different levels of uh, 
consumption or rather different levels of MPC. So instead of what determines the values of C1, a better way of stating this might be to ask the question, how do we make savings and consumption decisions? So the fact that I have decided to consume 75% of my income, how did I arrive at this answer? What led me to make this decision? And uh, we are not going to go through these two models, but I'm going to mention two models that are mentioned in the book and are really great models uh, for students of economics to take a look at. And I'm sure you guys will go through them in a separate course, maybe not this one. One is the permanent income theory of consumption. So this was developed by uh, Milton Friedman who also won the Nobel Peace Prize. Uh, I think I think he was from Chicago. And then we have the, the life cycle theory of consumption. Which was developed by Modigliani. And I think Modigliani was probably from MIT. So what we are going to look at in this chapter is sort of like a combination of these two, uh, but we won't really look into any details into these two models. But if you are interested in the discipline, if you enjoy economics, I mean, feel free to Google them, okay? So, okay. Now let us come back to this question that we had asked. How do we make savings and consumptions decisions? Okay, so let me write that down again. How does the individual decide how much to spend or to consume? And it depends on a few things. The first thing that it depends on it's something called human wealth. Uh, and human wealth is in short, just the after tax income or the disposable income that we are going to have. So when we're deciding on how much we are going to spend, we take a look at our income, income that is left over after paying tax, and we decide how much we can spend. Another thing that this depends on is the non-human wealth. And non-human wealth are of two types. Uh, let me write this down. So first we have a financial wealth. So if you have stocks, if you have bonds, if you have savings, or if in the reverse, if you have debts, you have taken loans from someone else, that's also part of your non-human wealth. Or the opposite, you have negative wealth, you owe someone something. These are all part of, you know, factors that are going to lead you, help you in deciding how much to spend or can or consume. Next up, we have, uh, what else do we have? We have housing wealth. Now, it doesn't necessarily just have to be housing. We may also say it's something like physical wealth. A house is a wealth. Uh, a car can be a wealth, although the value of car goes down quite rapidly. But any physical assets that we have that is valuable, uh, can be part of this. So not just housing, 
but let's also say housing or physical wealth assets that we have so financial wealth and housing wealth together gives us our non-human wealth okay and when we combine one and two together human wealth and non-human wealth we get what is known as total wealth so when we are deciding how much money we should spend these are the things that we take a look at okay we look at how much income we have we look at how much savings we have stocks and bonds or debts that we have we take a look at how many physical assets do we have do we have a house how much can we get if we sell the house and things like this and together that determines our total wealth which helps us decide how much to spend i'm going to give an example right now so if it's still not clear to all of you how much to spend it's going to decide. and what we do once we have this total wealth is we divide this wealth over our lifetime so let's just jump straight into an example and that should clarify actually i'm going to start a new video for the example 